Hi, welcome back to another session on inflation. Now you're saying, I'm tired of inflation. I want to talk about it. Well, guess what? Inflation is not tired of you. And in a market where inflation becomes front and center, it tends to drive everything else out of the discussion. If you remember, in my last session, I talked about how inflation affects different asset classes. And in particular, I drew a contrast between expected inflation, which you can build into your returns and your pricing, and unexpected inflation, which affects you as a surprise. And I said, in general, unexpected inflation is bad for financial assets, stocks and corporate bonds and treasury bonds. And the only asset classes that are either unaffected or relatively, maybe even positively affected, tend to be asset classes like gold and collectibles and real estate. At least that was true in the 1970s. Now, it's been a long time since we've had higher and more volatile inflation, but we're in a stretch where that seems to now be the prevailing set of numbers. Now, having said that inflation is bad for financial assets and for stocks in general, it's worth noting that the effect of inflation on individual companies can be very different. Some companies can actually benefit from inflation, there are very few. Many can be affected lightly and even more are affected more adversely. Now you think, why do you care? In a, in, a, in a period where investors are looking to buy hedges against inflation, looking to see what kinds of companies should be investing in, answering the question of which companies are lightly affected and heavily affected by inflation becomes front and center. Now, of course, the conventional wisdom is go buy commodity companies, perhaps companies with pricing power and you're going to be okay. Well, that might be too facile an answer. And I want to look at a more, more general question. What are the characteristics of companies that make them less or more exposed to inflation? To answer that question, I went back to valuation basics. Ultimately, the value of a company is determined by six variables. Three relate to its business model, revenue growth ca that captures the growth part of the business, operating margins that reflect how profitable the business is, and how efficiently the company delivers revenues by looking at how much it has to reinvest to get those revenues. On the risk side, there are three components as well. The cost of raising equity from markets or investors to get the company going, the cost of debt that reflects the default risk of the company, and the chance your company will not make it a failure risk. Everything valuation has to flow through those six inputs. Now let's see how inflation drives each of those six variables. Let's take revenue growth. When you have inflation, companies with pricing power are in a much better position to deal with inflation because they can pass prices through to their customers. Because that then allows your revenues to at least grow at the rate of inflation. Now, on in operating margins, the determinant of how inflation plays out is what kind of cost structure you have and what inputs drive those costs. Why? A company with relatively low input costs, high gross margins, should be less affected by inflation than a company with lower gross margins. In, in, in addition, if your inputs that you need to get your revenues are inputs where you can't control inflation, it's a macro effect, and they are more exposed to inflation, you're going to get squeezed. There's a reason why airlines have a tough time dealing with unexpected inflation. They don't have much pricing power. And when there is inflation and on the, in, the, in, in oil prices, and oil prices are going up at a rate faster than inflation, their inputs are rising at a far higher rate than revenues, even if they can pass them through. Now, in terms of investment efficiency, you might wonder why does inflation play a role? Here's the reason. If you're a company that has to make long-term investments, an infrastructure company, a toll road company, a manufacturing company, if inflation is high and unstable, you get more reluctant to make those investments because you don't know what the inflation will look like five years from now, 10 years from now. In general, you find that companies with longer term investments with more rigidity, they can't back out of these investments, will be more affected by inflation than companies with shorter term and more flexible investments. So pricing power, cost structure, and the duration and the flexibility in your investments. Now, if you look at the risk side, let's, take, let's start with the cost of equity. Well, the cost of equity is going to be affected by higher inflation, partly by the risk-free rate going up. But because higher inflation also goes with more uncertainty about inflation, equity risk premiums will tend to go up. And if you're a riskier than average company, let's think about relative risk as being scaled around one. If you're riskier than average, you'd be more exposed to those changes. Riskier companies 
riskier in terms of equity risk, riskier companies should be more exposed to inflation's bad effects than safer companies. Look at the cost of debt. You've got a risk-free rate plus a default spread. But here again, as inflation goes up, your risk-free rate will go up and so will default spreads and more so for companies in lower ratings classes. So both the cost of equity and the cost of debt will go up more for riskier companies as inflation goes up. Finally, there's a failure risk issue. And if you're a young company with negative or low cash flows, inflation can be deadly for you. It can be deadly for you because you might not be able to make it through those negative cash flows because risk capital can dry up when inflation is high. So inflation can show up in your cash flows. It can show up in your discount rate. Is it possible that you're a company where inflation is benign? Yes. If your increase in cash flows coming from inflation offsets increase in your discount rate. But if I were to capture the variables that determine how affected a company is by inflation, I could list them out on this table. Let's start at the top. Talked about pricing power, saying, but what determines pricing power? There are three variables that determine how much pricing power you have. The first is what kind of product or service do you provide? The more discretionary the product or service you provide. Put simply, if your company, if your customers can delay buying it, defer buying it, you should be more affected by inflation. You have less pricing power than if you're a company that has non-discretionary products. If you're in a business where there's lots of competition, you have less pricing power than otherwise similar companies without that competition. The reason is simple. Even though you might want to increase prices, if your competitors don't, you're going to be left following them because otherwise your customers flee and go to the competitors. And thirdly, there are some businesses that are regulated. In the US, for instance, for a long time, utilities were regulated monopolies. What does that mean? At least in theory, the regulatory authority should let you pass inflation through to your customers because their mission is to make sure that you earn a sufficient return to stay in business, a return that matches your cost of equity. In practice, though, there's often a lag between actual inflation and regulatory authorities passing it through. So even there, you can see an effect on companies. That's pricing power. In terms of cost structure, there are two items that matter. The first is how much of your revenue is going to your cost of goods sold? What's the direct cost? of producing that extra unit. To give you a contrast, if you're a manufacturing company, the cost of producing the extra unit is significant. If you're an automobile company, you've got to make the car. It costs you money. If you're a software company, the cost of selling that extra unit of software is close to nothing. Companies that have higher gross margins are less affected by inflation than companies with lower gross margins. The second is, it depends on what inputs you need for your rent. Companies with inputs that are more exposed to inflation, commodities, skilled labor, will have a much better time fending it off than companies without input, without those inputs. So what kind of cost of goods sold do you have? What are the inputs that go into your costs? Now, in terms of investment efficiency, the biggest driver of how inflation affects you, the type of business you're in. An infrastructure company or a manufacturing company will in general be more negatively affected by inflation than a technology company. And part of the reason for that is technology companies make shorter term investments in infrastructure and manufacturing companies, and they also get more flexibility. It's easier to back out of an investment if you're a technology company than if you're a toll road company. On the cost of equity front, the sector you're in matters. If you're in a risky sector, you'll be more exposed to inflation than if you're in a safer sector. Utilities, which tend to have predictable and stable cash flows, will be less exposed to inflation than technology companies, where the sector can shift dramatically. The second is it depends on what parts of the world you operate. If you have significant portion of your revenues coming from risky countries, any increase in inflation will have a magnifying effect on your, on your cost of equity. As far as, uh, as far as cost of debt goes, it's entirely a function of your default, default risk. If you're a company with stable and high earnings, you're probably going to be less affected by inflation than if you're a company with unstable and low earnings. And if you have a lot of debt, that adds to your default risk. Companies which have borrowed more will tend to be more exposed to inflation than otherwise similar companies that have borrowed less. On failure risk, it depends on where you're in the life cycle. If you're a young company with negative or low cash flows, either because your business model is still being formed as unformed, 
you have a greater chance of failure risk than an older company with more established business models. And here again, the debt level matters. You can put your company at risk by borrowing too much, and that risk is exacerbated when you have higher inflation. So if you were designing the perfect inflationary hedge company, here's what you'd have. You'd have a company that sells non-discretionary products in a market where there's very little competition. It has pricing power. It has high gross margins. In fact, it has very little input costs, and the inputs it uses will tend to be inputs where it's less open to what happens outside, commodities, skilled labor. If you have, um, and, 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 and you'd like this company to be able to have short-term investments with a lot of flexibility. And in terms of risk, you'd like this company to have relatively high cash flows and fairly low debt. If you can have high and stable cash flows and low debt, you've reduced your risk to every, you've reduced your exposure to inflation on every dimension of risk. So pricing power, high, high gross margins, you know, input set where you've, you have some say in how, how much inflation you have in those inputs, you know, short duration investments with a lot of flexibility and low risk. So those would be the companies you'd be looking for. Now, we can always look at history to see if this has played out the way we expect it to. So in this, um, this graph and table, I've looked at the performance of, uh, of two groups, uh, of two well-established phenomena in markets. One is called the small cap premium, where if you look at the last 100 years in U.S. markets, small cap stocks have earned more than large cap stocks after adjusting for risk. The second is what's called the value factor, which is using price to book as a very simplistic proxy for value. Low price to book stocks have consistently outperformed high price to book stocks over very long periods. In this table though, if you, that you see below, I've actually listed out the performance of the small cap premium and the value factor by decade. And with each decade, I've also listed out the average inflation and the unexpected inflation. If you look at the small cap premium, it was highest in the 1960s and 70s. And those were, and if you look at the, in fact, the decades where the small cap premium is highest, they tend to be decades where the unexpected inflation was high and positive. In other words, inflation comes in higher than expected. In fact, it's not the level of inflation that seems to drive the small cap premium, it's the unexpected inflation. As for the value factor, it's tougher to explain. It was high in the 70s when both average inflation and unexpected inflation were high, but it was also high in the 80s when average inflation was high, but unexpected inflation became negative. In other words, inflation numbers started coming below expectations. More ups and downs, but over time you can see a significant variation in both these premiums. If you were to generalize, it would look like if you have high inflation and uncertainty about inflation, you'd want to buy small cap stocks and low price to book stocks. That was in the past though. You can ask, is that still true? And of course, all we have are five months of data in 2022 where inflation has been the lead story. And I decided to look at, look, take a look at how US stocks broken down, sliced and diced have looked like over these five months. I started by looking at the, sect, the, 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 the companies broken down by sector. There are about 7,000 companies in my sample, every publicly traded U.S. stock. And I looked at returns over three periods. The first is the first quarter of 2022, when inflation was a headline, but Russia also entered the headline somewhere during that period. But I've also looked at the period from April 1st through May, May 19th, which is a period where inflation was the only big story. And finally, year to date, that collects both the quarter one and the 4 one to 5 19 period. I've highlighted the three sectors that have, you know, the overall market's been down. It's been, it's down about, about 20% year to date in 2022, with 75% of the drop happening just in the last six weeks between April 1st and May 19th. The three worst performing sectors are highlighted there, technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services, which is increasingly becoming a technology business. Worst performing at least in the period 4 1 to 5 19, but also over the extended period. The best performing sectors, utilities, and of course energy. Energy, the real answer is, is, is obvious. Oil prices are up. Utilities, because they're an old, buy, you know, old standby whenever people get worried about risk, down only 1.33%. 
This is a return to more conventional crises. If you remember, during the COVID crisis, you did not see this phenomena play out. But during this crisis, you're seeing a much more conventional flight to safety. Now, if you break companies down by market cap from smallest decile to largest decile, so the bottom decile are the smallest companies and the, largest, and the top decile are the largest companies, again, you see the variation across the deciles. The smallest companies have done much better in the last four and a half months in 2022, and especially in the period since April 1st than the largest companies. Remember the small cap premium showing up in the 70s? It seems to be showing up again in 2022 as inflation consistently comes in above expectations. What about price to book? A little less, it, it, this is a little less strong than the small cap premium, but there is a rough link between what your price to book ratios are as a company and what your returns are. Low price to book stocks have done better than high price to book stocks during the last six weeks in particular, but over the entire year of 2022. A return to a value premium or a value factor that we haven't seen in perhaps a decade. Now, I decided to do other slices. I looked at equity risk. I used beta as my proxy for risk, and you can use you know, other measures of equity risk. And the riskiest stocks doing better or worse than the safer stocks. It looks like the riskiest stocks in general do worse than the safer stocks. But there's one exception. The stocks in the bottom decile, the lowest beta stocks, also have negative returns. Take what you, you, know, what, what you want out of it, but in a sense, there is a link broadly between equity risk and returns, but the link has this one break, the very smallest, the lowest beta stocks. When you break stocks down by bond rating, again, the relationship between returns and ratings is pretty weak. As when you go from A all the way probably down to triple B, but the one ratings class where there seems to be a consequence is if you're triple C and lower, it's been a terrible six weeks. So at least in general, there is some support for the notion that riskier companies, the very riskiest companies, are being hurt by inflation. Now, one final slice I took was to look at the cash flows of these companies. I used two measures of cash flows. One was a measure of operating cash flows. Now, I'm not a great fan of EBITDA, but it's a, it's a generic measure of operating cash flow before you do CapEx and working capital and debt payments. I looked at that cash flow as a percentage of enterprise value. Again, the way to read this table is the bottom decile includes firms which have the least cash flows, including negative cash flow companies. In fact, the first two or three deciles are mostly negative EBITDA companies, and the top decile are the companies with the highest EBITDA relative to enterprise value. If you look at the returns between April 1st and May 19th, you can see that the companies which had the most, uh, which had the most negative cash flows, the lowest cash flows, have done worse than the companies with the most positive if not the most positive cash flows, much higher cash flows. Now, I also looked at stocks based on dividend yields, a much more old-fashioned measure of cash flow, where you look at the cash return to shareholders as a percentage of market cap. Here, the, relate, the link is even stronger. Non-dividend paying stocks and stocks that pay very low dividends have done much worse than stocks that pay high dividends. Now, if you look at all these results and you're, um, you know, basically you're seeing that low P, low price to book stocks with high cash flows and high dividends and low risk are doing much better than companies the other extreme. If you're a value investor, you might view this as vindication. After all, isn't this the, the, the sermon you've been, you've been preaching for the last decade that these are the companies we should invest in? So I'm sure some value investors will view this as a return to normalcy, that we're now back to the old paradigm. You can go back to your Ben Graham books. Well, I'd be a little cautious about making that jump. Now, I do think a correction is overdue. We've spent a decade with growth stocks consistently beating value stocks, if you define growth stocks as high PE and high price to book. And that can't continue either. You can't have that persistence. So correction was long overdue. Is this the correction? Well, we'll find out. Is the correction over? We'll find out that as well. But I don't think this is the start of some new, it's not the dawn of some uh, of a return to old-fashioned value investing, at least in, from my point of view. Which brings me to the bottom line. It's been a painful year so far for investors in U.S. equities, but the pain is not equally spread. Some people have been hurt far more than others. 
the question of whether this pain will continue and worsen and whether the trends we've seen this year will continue for the rest of the year? The answer depends not surprisingly on what you think about inflation. If you think there are more surprises to come, more adjustments to make to inflation, more unexpected inflation around the horizon, then I think what you saw in the first five months of 2022 with small cap stocks, boring value companies doing better than large cap companies or risky companies, well, I think you're going to see more of the same. If you believe that the adjustment to inflation is mostly done, no, no, betting on a continuation of the trends you've seen in 2022 could lead you to the same kind of disappointments you had in the last decade. And to the extent that that inflation is a currency specific phenomenon and you can find other countries perhaps where inflation is not the clear and present danger that it is in the US, perhaps shifting some of your money into equities in those countries can help you at least partially. The bottom line is there is no place to hide. Inflation is now the story that's driving markets. And whenever inflation becomes a story that drives markets, it eats up, it sucks up all the oxygen in the air. There is no time to talk about any other issue. And I have a feeling that we're going to talk a lot more about inflation for the rest of this year.